just if it hasn't returned isn't good enough. Yeah. Alright. Yes, right. Um, so now I've got quotes around it, and this seldom happens. Evolution is Bayesian inference. No results fine. I'm so pleased. This afternoon, I hope to convince you that there is, that we can, there's certainly a point of view where we can start regarding evolution as a Bayesian inference. Now, um, in case you think I'm a total loony, obviously, ah, do, 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 do come in. Um, I want kind of all people to be here. Your sign would refuse it, that might, <laughs> that might have something to do with it. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, your sign would refuse it. Alright. Well, yeah, two can play at that game. Right. Okay. Um, so, so what I heard you, um, in case, uh, I mean, in case you think I'm a loony, the, the um, um, geneticists have, of course, noticed that uh, standard distributions like the beta distribution keep coming up. Um, and so I, I looked in my genetics books again to double check that none of this. Time. And these guys, Charlesworth and Charlesworth, the standard textbook on, 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 on genetics, recent and everything. Um, at a certain point, they say, yes, and the following distribution is well known in statistics, the beta distribution. Um, but the, it's very convenient. But only this, what they're really interested in is lots and lots and lots of complications. They love um, um, uh, uh, complicated things. Whereas I like simple things. So we're going to talk about it in a simple way. So um, what I promised you I was going to do um, is to talk about Good. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, for now. Um, talk about. As it gets simple, when you're faced with something quite complicated, and what I think, I hope you've noticed about evolutionary computation is that people love computations. There's some mystical method, people have to do lots and lots of little variations of genetic algorithms, um, and trying to complicate things, I will simplify. So I will find something which is as plausible as any of the genetic algorithms um, that uh, appear in the books, so as bio-inspired or possibly more so, um, and which you can analyze in a really simple way, which seems like a good idea to me. Right. Right. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about a tiny genetic algorithm. So, one gene, or one locus, alleles maybe zero, or one, are uh, n individuals, so your population is always going to look like something like this. Um, N of them, and no selection at first. Uh, and then hmm, we'd better have some mutation. So these are pretty simple creatures. Right, the zeros are ones. They're living now. Um, now, uh, let's say this is actually, this is already, with probability u, 
probability, uh, uh, let's call it u0, a u0 is created with from u1 a mu1. We must have u0 plus u1 equals u. Right. This is already complicated. There are kind of two parameters. There's n, the population size. There's u. What's this doing? Actually, there's u0 and u1. What are they doing? And we haven't even put in selection yet. So, um, it turns out we've got simple enough. So, let's describe breeding. And this happens one at a time. You randomly, let's uh, delete a randomly selected individual. Okay. And with a random individual, and we propose and accept, we, we, we sample say theta k, and we need to have our new value of theta k, and we've got theta k uh, with probability u, it's a mutation, a new mutant, because we're only allowing 0 to 1, they're not terribly new, so it's only going to be a 0 or 1, right? Um, new mutant with you know, probability of 0 with, with probability u0 over u and 1 with probability u1 over u. And with prob 1 minus u, um, I'm going to use the following notation. I'm going to say it's basically sample from uniform Okay, of uh, I'm going to use a sort of math lab like ah, do 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 come in, so a sort of math lab like get everything except k. This means the whole sequence except k, and uh, by uniform I mean I'm taking a uniform choice out of that all those values. Is that reasonable? Sorry, it's gone down the bottom. The only piece of new mutation has gone down the bottom of the board. But do, do, do stand up and peer and take a look, close look or say, could I not copy it somewhere else? Please do interrupt. This means, this, this means, so let's put it at the top of the board. Bye. Bye. Uniform of theta k, and I mean a choice of any of theta one, theta k minus one, theta k plus one, theta n with equal probability. So in biological terms, I'm saying that it's basically kind of um, uh, panmictic, all, all individuals in, in, in bioterminology, terminology, They might call they sometimes call it panmictic breeding. We haven't started. I think this is really 
I will be making this very simple assumption in that uh, you know, all organisms breed with equal, well, everyone equally like, by the everyone equally likely to breed to breed, and if you've got sexual, thing, then you're equally likely to breed with anybody else. There's no sex here because we've only got one gene. <laughs> So um, you can't really have sense if you've only got one gene um, because there's no sort of mixing and there are, there's no, 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 no duplication or anything. Uh, uh, so, so this is just doing that. Is this kind of reasonable? Does this kind of make sense? Yeah, this is all. This is, could that be a simpler model? Tough. All right, good. And we're in the right region. We understand a really simple model. We, we can do it. Okay. Um, so we observe one. Observe. Reading is a Markov chain. And if you like, states of the chain are populations. Okay. And if the population is in a certain state, according to this breeding, it, it, it's equally likely. That all you need to know to know what the next population is likely to be, or what the probability, probability possible next populations are, is to know what the current population is. So you've got a Markov chain on populations. So. Have you done very much? I do advise you to write this stuff down. I really advise you to. What I always tell people is that um, even if you have incomplete notes, even if your notes consist principally of doodles of me hanging on a noose from the ceiling, um, nevertheless, you will remember many, many times more of this lecture than this one. And I'm trying to make making an effort to go to speed where I can write stuff on the board and you can write it down, this means that you will understand this at least once. Okay? Um, right. The states of populations. Um, and so we get, so it's like going from I know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0 to, okay, we might go to 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay, we need to change on time. And oh, I'm, uh, I'm assuming, um, hmm, what was the assumption here? Constant population size. This is more or less. Just keeping things really simple. And that is more or less implicit in the definition of breeding that I've given. It doesn't change the population size, but it's just make that as an assumption. Yeah? Why did the theta of k disappear? Sorry? The theta of k disappear. That's a very good question. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, good. Yeah, <laughs> so let's, let's thank you very much for that question. I should have said that. Yeah, this will emerge later. Um, yeah. Uh, the answer is it turns out. Um, it's going to enable me to call this Gibbs sample. To draw an analogy. It's going to be mathematically convenient. So uh, the first geneticist to study models, okay, the geneticist, population geneticists studied models of of this kind of type, ranges, and most commonly they studied one where the new generations read a whole new generation from the current generation. So the generations don't overlap. It's non-overlapping generations. So that's called the Wright Fisher process. And there was a geneticist called Moran who studied breeding one at a time. And as he pointed out, hang on, if you breed one at a time, um, all your formula get a lot simpler. Um, because your changes are simpler. You're making much simpler changes to the population. But he actually bred one and then killed one. Whereas I'm killing one and then breeding one. Okay? So I can understand, and, and actually, the formula remained pretty, so, pretty simple in both cases. But I think this is this is neater. Um, 
it's curious that they, they didn't study this more. Um, and we're, we're you're going to see why this is neat. Now you say, well, okay, but surely you could, but in nature, you could have a population where you breed one and then it kills one. Well, yes. Okay. Natural evolution is messy. So my aim is to have as simple a model as possible about which I can tell a plausible evolutionary Farrell story. Okay, so I mean, my aim is to abstract, and then uh, go on. So, so it turns so that it's 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 considerably nicer. We'll see in a moment why this is not. Nice. That's that's a very good point. That's a key point, actually. So uh, die first. Well, I, I haven't actually found any. I haven't looked comprehensively through the popular mathematical genetics literature, but I haven't found anybody who's actually used a model like that. But it seems equally plausible. And of course, it's rather difficult if you've only got a population of one. It's a bit inconvenient. Okay, let's breed, bang, kill it there. The population's gone, right? So maybe that's why Moran added one before killing one. And so we could use a population of one. But I don't know. So that, that, that's, that's, a, that's, that's a key point. So, so the key point is one and two resample D to K. All right, so let's carry on. Um, it's Margaret Jane states of populations and breeding, breeding a stochastic. Transition between populations. Um, E.g., so we must have actually killed this one and bred a new one back. Um, and also, with population n, with oh, of size. N, it's a finite Markov chain. With two to the n space. Right. Have you done any theory of finite Markov chains? No. <clears throat> so if you have a finite Markov chain, you've got a finite number of states, and for each state, you go with certain probabilities to other states. Um, you probably have done some theory of it without kind of realizing it, but let me convince you of something. Let's. Mm -hmm. um, I always find it easier to visualize something. Okay, let's, let's visualize. So you can imagine the current state is here, then you can move to here, and then you sort of have arrows going off here. And so you have your current state and this point is dancing around. 
over this thing, like that. Is that, is that a familiar image? Is this some an image you've had in your mind before? Right. Okay. Now, um, we might imagine, say, lots of populations doing that. We might imagine lots and lots of independent simulations going. So you'd start off with lots of little, I don't know, beads of different colors on this, and they go. And at first, even if you start, whatever you, however you start it, if you put a thousand little red dots on here, and then each little red dot goes through the Markov chain, eventually, all those little red dots will settle into a, um, a, a, a and you look at the Markov chain from a distance, you see the little red dots settling around. Eventually, you'll see that the red dots settle into a certain equilibrium distribution on the chain. If you have a million rock dots, this is this is a familiar idea. Right. It will approach an equilibrium distribution. Um, and that's an interesting thing. Usually, given a fire and chain, what you want to know is what the equilibrium distribution is. Um, so we'll have an equilibrium distribution. Distribution over states is denoted by pi, usually. Yeah. But where does the um, finite part come in? Uh, it makes everything easier. Okay. If you've got infinite chains, you can have um, pathological things happen. Where if you've got infinity, you can have bad things happen. If it's finite, it's simple. Yes. So we're testing that in that sentence. Uh, each arrow has a probability. Each arrow, arrows leaving a state have probabilities that sum to one. Probs that sum to one. Okay. Um, so, so you, know, you visualize a huge pile of red dots, maybe a million of them sitting here, and you go, and and then they'll eventually settle into some distribution over the chain. Not all states of the chain will have equal probabilities. Um, and, and some, they'll tend to be more red dots in some of these states than others. Is that, is that clear? Right. And with a finite chain, I'm just going to remark with a finite chain, Markov chain, Markov chain, if you like. There can be only there are only two pathological things. Anyone, anyone else here? Any, only two things can mess this. Can, can, what are they? The finite chain. Pathological. There are only two pathological possibilities. And if you're doing Continuous analysis, there are all sorts of horrible pathological functions. There are functions with discontinuities, there are functions with no gradients and everything. With infinite Markov chains, with a finite Markov chain, so we've got a finite number of states. Um, and it does work pathological. It can be periodic. It can be periodic. No, I, I mean, well, I'm just introducing them to say that we aren't not there. I mean, I mean, this is so, this, this these facts about Markov chains are used so often in so many different places that I might as well tell you about them here. It can be periodic. This is a chain. This is a periodic chain. So this is this one here is, uh, if you like, I'm going to give it a different color to, to, to my, my pen usage. Because this has probability of one half and one half, and this has probability of one and one, okay? This chain is never going to approach an, a, a single equilibrium distribution. Because if I put a million dots here, on the second step, they'll either be they'll half a million here and half a million there, and then the third step will all be back here and so on. So this is a, so it can be periodic. Um, 
And secondly, it could be disconnected. I'm just sort of um, putting these up because, because it's connected. I can go, let me draw you a picture of a disconnected chain. I'm going through this at some length, and so none of you said, well, yeah, we, 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 we know all that. So this is, for example, here's a disconnected chain. Okay. Okay. This chain does not have a single equilibrium distribution because if I put a red dot here, it can either go to that or it can go to that and then it will never go anywhere else. So once it's here, it will stay there, and once it's there, it will stay there. There is no single equilibrium distribution. If there's a periodic one, there's no single equilibrium distribution, there's this. Right, let's, um, are you clear on this? This is, this is kind of... So these are examples of no... Uh, these, these are examples of pathological things. Uh, I, I, and the reason I'm saying this is not because these are going to occur, they're not. Well, I'm going to say in a, in a finite Markov chain, if it's a halfway reasonable, interesting finite Markov chain, what you know about it with great certainty is that it has one single equilibrium distribution. Which I think I'm not going to prove. It's intuitively pretty obvious. But there are two cases to just mention which you've got to check. It's easy to define a chain which is periodic. Okay? And that doesn't have a single. So if Um, so it's populations, reading as a Markov chain. So we have going up to here. If a finite Markov chain is neither periodic nor disconnected, it has a unique equilibrium distribution by the state space after a sufficiently long time, after sufficiently many transitions, in any state x, zero, after sufficiently many transitions, of x t equals so it's just distributed according to pi. Are you happy with this? It's distributed according to people have been writing this for ages. You've been taking lectures from David Barber. Does he not use this? Are you happy with this notation? You can say no. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's fine. It's so fine. You're saying x of t goes as pi. Yeah, okay. pretty much. For well, sufficiently many transitions, sufficiently t goes as pi. Usually, you want to find pi. So the first thing I want to do with this evolutionary algorithm is find what its equilibrium distribution is. Okay? Is that obvious? <coughs> yes? So when do you write as a pi, a distribution by or state space? Okay, xt, this is the random variable. By this I mean the random state <coughs> after t transitions.
for some large tea. When tea is sufficiently big, mm. it's often very difficult to say how big it needs to be. Does it need to be 10? Does it need to be 1,000? Does it need to be a million? Does it need to be 10 to the 28? You don't know. But you know, mathematically, that after a sufficiently large number of transitions, you're going to get to an equivalent distribution. Is that, does that? No, I was just, I, I think it's just, I think uh, what you wrote down just after, it has a unique equilibrium distribution, pi, and I don't know. Yeah, the word between pi and state. Pi and state pair. Oh, ah, yes, it's missing a letter. That's rather unfortunate. Right. OK, sorry. Um, right. So what we want to know is what's the equilibrium distribution of this? OK. Sorry. Slightly slower than I intended. Oh, wait, 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 no, it hasn't. I started at 10 parts, because we've all been going to machine vision parts. <laughs> so how do I have I've been going to perfectly reasonable speed for a Friday afternoon. Um, right. So the tiny genetic algorithm couldn't be sent to the one. What's its equilibrium? Well, let's figure this out. This doesn't look too bad. We could do it directly, or we could do it subtly. Let's do it subtly. Can I, work, can I wipe all this off? Good. Um, thank you so much for asking questions because, I mean, um, it's uh, really um, it's incredibly refreshing, actually. It's a, Right. Okay. So let's. Um, we're going to get its um, distribution. Let's find the equilibrium distribution. Let's go there. blue. Find the equilibrium distribution. Find pi for T G F. Let's have a subtle approach. And we could do it brute force and, and, and try, but let's, let's, have a, let's have a more subtle approach. Uh, and let's consider, what I'm going to do is to consider a polya urn model, which you may have encountered. You've done urn models? They're nice. It's all right. There's not much more, and they make phase imprints free. Um, right, so present the, the urn model is a basically a visualization um, of uh, uh, the, the Bayesian approach to the binomial distribution. Has anybody seen poly urn models before? Let's see. Okay. So, so you come, an urn is basically a pot. Urn. And let's have a, a black ball and a white ball. We can imagine this as a solitary game. Let's consider a solitary game that you might play forever. A solitary game. Repeat. Randomly. Randomly take the ball out of the line. To put it back with 
another ball of the same colour. Right. Um, that's it. Repeat for up. So let's just consider this. What happens? What happens? On how to interpret this. Um, well, the first pick is equally likely to be red or black. If you take out a white one, oh, and I take out the white. I stick in another white. And I'm more likely to take out a white again, but I might take out a black. Uh, let's say I take out a white, pick out another white, I pick out a black, and I put in a black, then my probability is settling down. Um, and I, so I carry on. What is this process? Well, um, when you are, this is, Let's 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 well, let's let's um, do it in a certain way. How many jumps? Let's uh, do it. So, so the problem to this. So we start off with say, start with alpha zero zeros in um, it's always black, whatever, and alpha one ones. Okay. What is probability? Is probability of taking the sequence, say, I don't know, uh, zero, one, zero, zero, one. So, so this this R model is actually very closely, I mean, it's a sort of almost a visualization of the process of uh, uh, forming a, 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 um, a Bayesian inference um, on, on a binomial distribution. If you start off with one black and white ball, one white ball, you're, if you've observed, do you, in your Bayesian inference class, do you call, do, did you do Laplace law of succession? No? I bet you did. I think you did. Let me show you here. And I say I have no compunction in teaching and talking about all this because it's it's a it's a sort of a, a visualization of Bayesian inference from a different point of view from what you've done it, which is what you've been, been taught and learning everything. Um, so, so let's do this. Um, well, 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 let's, let's figure this out and then we'll see where, where we get to. What's the probability? If I start with, I start with one zero and one one in the um, what is the of probability P of drawing prob of drawing the sequence of balls I draw of the sequence of balls in zero one zero zero one. Let's let's figure that out. Well, P of 1, if you like, this is a sequence, is just a half. It's alpha 1 over alpha. I say that's on 
alpha 0 plus alpha 1 equals alpha. Okay? Alpha from 0 and alpha 1 are going to be kind of like mu naught mu 1. They're not strongly connected to those, but they're not the same things. Okay. P of... I'm sorry. I still don't, the first one's a 0, isn't it? 0, that's alpha 0. Sorry about that. P of 1 given 0 and alpha 0 and alpha 1 equals, well, uh, that's actually, since I took out the 0, I put another 0 back in, didn't I? So this time, I've got alpha plus 1 balls in the urn. It's number of balls in the urn. And uh, as a 1, so I've got alpha 1 over alpha plus 1. This is, here, this is the number of balls in the urn. This is number of of one balls. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's going to be clear. Okay, then let's have it's worth drawing this whole thing out. P of then I want a zero given uh, zero one of zero and of one. Well, now I've got alpha plus 2, because I've got two that balls in the work. In the end. How many zeros I've got in the end? I've got actually alpha 0 plus 1. And oh. P of another 0, given as 0, 1, 0, and alpha 0, and alpha 1, is. What is that? I've, I've got. I've got alpha th plus three balls in the in the urn. I've got three draws so far, so I've done that. And uh, it's alpha zero. I've got two plus two. P of a one given zero, one, zero, zero, and alpha zero and alpha one equals, oh my goodness, I've got alpha plus four on the, on the bottom. And then I've got alpha one plus one. So I can now multiply a whole lot together. So P of uh, what is it? Zero, one, zero, zero, one, given alpha zero and alpha one equals well, on the bottom. Oh that's easy. The first one's got to be alpha, alpha plus one. This is alpha, alpha plus one. Alpha plus two to alpha plus four. And then, uh, well, the first is that the zeros are alpha zero, alpha zero plus one to um, alpha zero plus two. And we've got alpha one into alpha one plus one. Oh, huh. this is kind of neat. This is starting to look nice. It looked horrible, and that's starting to look quite nice because, like the denominators, these are just these just increase by one every time we draw a ball, right? And the numerators, well, they increase by one every time we draw a ball of that color. Huh? Yeah. Is that an alpha zero? Oh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely right. So that's, ah, this is cool. And it's starting to look cool. Um, you may notice that uh, in, in Bayesian inference, let's just put it this way, let's have a remark. If we um, if we have a prior over a by over the parameter over the probability of probability of a biased 
coin being heads and prior is uniform in zero one, then is this model be using the beta distribution? Exactly. This is it. This is the beta distribution mm -hmm. reappearing. So the polya Ohm model is an unbearably elegant little annoying mathematical fairy tale. And what's actually going on is that you start off with a beta distribution. There's the, 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 the balls you have in your urn at the beginning specify a beta prior. And then as time goes on, you have more observations. You know, so the beta prior is specified by like pseudo observations. You've seen pseudo observations. Right. That's exactly what I wanted. What, what I actually want is the polyurn model. model. Um, then, then the, the predictive probability, probability, you're happy with predictive probabilities in Bayesian stuff. You've had a prior, you've got some old observations, and now you're, you want a probability of what you're going to observe next. Okay, that's your predictions you're making. Where you your predicted probability of say observing of observing one after n zero zeros h that's h after and h heads and n and t tails is, what is it, it's um, nh plus 1 over nt plus nh plus 2. So this is a formula you may have heard of, seen before. If you read Jeffrey's on probability and everything, if you take a prior. So, so what is this predictive probability? I didn't have to see a huge nodding of heads talking about predictive probability. You're not happy with predictive probability? Say no if you're not. You can say no. Okay. Right. Suppose I'm a Bayesian and you have a coin in your pocket. You're quite pleased with this coin and it may well be biased. Okay. Or maybe we've discovered a coin together. There's a biased coin. And the behavior of this coin, if I, if I toss it, successive throws are going to be independent, right? Given the characteristics of the coin, it's going to be a physical coin. But um, we don't know what its bias is. It could be a, a coin that comes up heads 90% of the time, or a coin that comes up tails 90% of the time. We have none. So we look at this coin together, and we think we've got to do some things. We, we are going to go out, and we're going to win loads of money off people in the cafe, down in you know, UCL, by getting you know, art students to bet, or whatever. Um, and, but we, first of all, we've got to figure out exactly what the characteristics of this coin are. So we realized that we had been doing a course in Bayesian statistics. Damn. We've better use it. Okay? And what we want to know, we want to know so given a biased coin. with unknown probability of heads equals theta. We want to estimate theta from experiments. And predict results of 
against drugs. Okay. So if you want to, so these are two different things. Theta is an abstract quantity. It is the chance that this coin, the probability that this coin, if I toss it, comes up heads. Now, the concrete thing you might want to do is to predict the result of the next throw. Okay, we're getting, I wish I could, right. Okay. So these are two related but distinct things I may wish to do. Now, take a prior. If you're a good Bayesian, you say, right, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I can debate for hundreds of pages and hundreds of papers disputing with other p-statisticians over what the best priors are, but it doesn't really matter that much, does it? Um, I'm going to pick a prior, which is pretty uninformative, and then I'm going to do some experiments, and the, the empirical data will overwhelm my prior fairly quickly, um, and I can then start predicting the results of tossing that coin. Now, um, so take prior of theta equals one for i.e. if we plot the graph of it to theta between 0 and 1, because this is the probability density, it's a 1, it's a uniform distribution, it's uniform. Okay? Now, then we start tossing coins. Okay? And we know that um, posterior appeared I get Bayesian up here. Let's get Bayesian up here. Theta, given some observation x, so parameter given some observation x is what? It's proportional to seen this. Um, now this is just as this is basically a normalization constant. This is a this is for normalization. So um, in the case of the coin, if, it, if x is, um, hmm, we're gonna break, I'm going to do this and I'm going to break soon, then we'll come back and we'll do the genetic algorithm, okay? Let's complete this bit. All right, so I'm going to be looking rest of the chapel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is proportional to p of x given theta, p of theta. So p of theta is uniform, so p of theta given x is going to be proportional to p of x given theta, p of theta, well that equals theta cubed 1 minus theta times 1, that's 1, this is theta cubed 1 minus theta, okay? 
Oh, so now I've got a belief distribution over how biased the coin is. Okay? Hmm. That's pretty abstract. What I really want to know is, given all these possibilities, what's the probability of getting heads next time? Is this a familiar question to you? So this is posterior. This is, this is if you like, posterior over theta. Right. OK. So what I really want to know, a predictive over x, OK, over, over a new observation is, is, is uh, and a view of x. So all I want to know is p of x new heads, right? Mm. This is, if you like, the integral of p of x nu given theta over p of theta given x and prior. Okay? To theta. So I want to add up over all the possible values of theta how plausible that possible value of theta is, and then how up down I am going to get an x nu. Is this a familiar integral? Okay. Well, if you do this for this and you put in all the normalization constants, if you start with one more that, um, it turns out to be for the earn model, the earn model is great. The earn model, if you like, we we instead of drawing from the on, on, from the urn, we're, we're told what our observations are. So we plot those observations back into the urn. We can see the urn model, it's simply going to be you know, nh plus 1 over nt plus a plus or, or rather nh plus alpha 0. But here, and, and this for uniform theta, if prior and the theta, if you do the integral, the vertical you find p of n of x nu equals heads equals n h plus one over n h plus n t plus two. It's just known as Laplace's law of succession. Part of Laplace, we did a whole lot more Bayesian computations than the plays ever did. Very slightly later, we really figured it out. Laplace. So, but this is actually what we got from the Earn model. And the Earn model. Um, we can allow with Earn model switch to purple to differentiate everything.
Okay. So there's a sort of connect. So, right. What I'm going to do next, I'm going to allow a brief break. What I'm going to do next after this is I'm going to show you how to get the exact distribution of the tiny genetic algorithm by stopping the urn and, um, and figuring that out using something called Gibbs sampling, which is, again, is, this, is Gibbs sampling a term you've heard? Yes. Good. This is going to be a nice example of Gibbs sampling. So, so have a break. It's going to be a very nice example to give something. Um, I, I mean, it's great. It's like, this is like a, your revision lectures in Bayesian statistics as part of a different course. Is that okay? Have you got any objections to this? Good. So uh, um, this is a long afternoon. How long a break do you want? Is five minutes enough to go and get stuff? So we say seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start talking again after seven minutes. People who are not here will miss. Stuff. All right. Good. Hey there. Uh, when this is